Welcome to the sixth and final session in our uh, course on the formation of our Bibles. I hope that you've been gaining something from this, and I hope that the resources in each section have been valuable for you. And now this final section, we're going to look at Sola Scriptura and why Sola Scriptura is important. And uh, once again, in the study notes, there are uh, study questions, and I would encourage you to uh, ponder those, go through those. If you're in a group, discuss them. Um, maybe discuss them in your small group. Even if uh, other people aren't going through them, maybe just uh, bring up some of the questions and ask some other people, because it's always good to um, kind of hear what other people have to say about these things. So, Sola Scriptura, let's dive right in. As I stated in uh, the last uh, session that we had, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis to the door at Wittenberg on October 31st, 1517. And this was kind of a pinnacle moment in Christianity. The Reformers, as a whole, were part of the Catholic Church, but were fighting against doctrinal error. So if you look at the Reformers, and you look at, um, you know, Luther, if you look at Tyndale, if you look at, you know, j just pretty much any of the Reformers, they were bishops, they were uh, priests, they were, you know, they were a part of the Catholic Church, but then they felt like something wasn't quite right. And so they were fighting against what they thought was error in the Catholic Church. Within Luther's 95 Thesis were the five solas. That is, sola fide, which means by faith only, and meaning not by works. Uh, sola scriptura, by scripture only. Uh, sola Chris, Christus, through Christ alone, sola gratia, by grace only, and soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone. Each one of the five solas is a direct assault on various doctrines and practices within the Catholic Church. And uh, Tyndale's translation of the Bible threatened the Catholic Church in more ways than one. Not only did it challenge authority structure of the Church and the Pope, but it also meant a significant financial hit, and this is really where you have problems. And also, so did Luther's 95 Thesis, because he was fighting against selling indulgences. Now, this is a lecture for a different time, but if you take away the selling of indulgences, then all of a sudden, there's not nearly as much uh, money coming in. If the common person had the word of God, they might realize that things such as, as giving money to the church, buying indulgences, or even submitting to the authority of the Pope were not actually commanded in the words of Scripture. And of course, uh, if you have a monopoly on the Scriptures, you wouldn't want that. The government and the church were closely linked, and each one used the other to further their own gain and power. An offense against the church was an offense against the government. And this is why things were so dicey. If the government, if the, if the church says you're not allowed to have the, uh, the scriptures in, in English, and then you have scriptures in English, well, it's not just an offense against the church like it would be today. No, it's, a, it's an offense against the government. And so there's government and church involvement. If the, uh, so, uh, uh, I'm sorry, an offense against the church was an offense against the government. This threat led the, to the burning of, the, of the heretics by the Catholic Church, and many believers were tortured and burned for being unwilling to recant in preaching against doctrines such as transubstantiation, um, which is the belief that the communion becomes the actual body of Christ, Pado baptism that is baptizing infants and saying the pope was not the direct mouthpiece of god that is pope authority the reformation uh, principle of sola scriptura that is by scripture alone that's once again what that means was given the status of the formal cause of the reformation by melanchthon and his lutheran followers the formal cause was distinguished from the material ca cause of sola fide by faith alone that is, and I mean, I think that that's, that is somewhat obvious, but just so that everyone's clear, that is the doctrine that we are justified, we are saved by, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's not any work that we do. I can't do any work that's going to gain my salvation. We are saved by the work that Christ does, not by the work that we do. And so that was the doctrine of sola fide. Sola scriptura is uh, a, another doctrine, that, and this is what we're getting to. Though the chief the theological issue of the Reformation was the question of the matter of justification, the controversy touched heavily on the underlying question of authority. 
As is usually the case in theological controversy, the issue of ultimate authority lurked in the background, though it was by no means hidden or obscure. Of Luther's struggles of struggle with Rome over justification, the question of the source of Luther's doctrine and the normative authority by which it was to be judged was vital to his cause. And that was a quote by James Montgomery Boyce. And so, end quote there, I'm sorry. Sola Scriptura did not teach that the Bible was the only authority in a believer's life, and this is very important, but rather that it was the final authority in a believer's life. The re- and so... Uh, I, I think that we need to be clear about this. Sola Scriptura does not teach that you can't read commentaries on the Bible because the Bible is the only authority. No. It means that the Bible is the final authority. In other words, if there's any question on doctrine or if there's any question on, on practice, what do we do? We look at the Bible and what the Bible says. And that is the final authority. The Reformers were all individuals within the Catholic Church who were pushing for change. Although they were fighting the Catholic Church, they still believed in a universal church. And that's what Catholic means. Catholic means universal. So uh, they still believed in a universal church. They just didn't believe in the Catholic Church. From 1517, as it was under that authority structure, it should be very. Uh, we should be very clear that that what was being uh, what was being fought against primarily was the the Pope and the Church councils, and the authority that they believed that they held that was they believed was a God given authority. From 1517 until the Diet of Worms in 1521, and I always thought that that, uh, that sounded interesting, but Worms is a place in Germany, um, and it was the, the Diet of Worms is, is a, essentially a trial that uh, took place uh, against Martin Luther. So from 1517 until the Diet of Worms in, in 1521, Luther's own theological understanding of Sola Scriptura continued to be refined. So, yes, he nailed his 95 Thesis to the door, but we see this, this progression of Luther's theology throughout, the, throughout his life. In 1518, Luther met with Cardinal uh, Cajetan, and I, I'm very bad at my pronunciation of names, so you're going to have to forgive me, and don't, uh, I, <laughs> don't uh, quote my, my pronunciation of these names. During their discussions, Luther admitted that, the, that he believed the Pope could err, and this was huge, because the Pope was in charge. Remember, we said that the, that the government and the church were intertwined. Well, the Pope was the head of the, of the church and essentially the head of the government in many ways. In 1519, Johannes von Eck was able to get Luther to admit that not only could the Pope err, but church councils could as well. So this is, once again, a very uh, egregious mark against Luther from the church's uh, view and from the government's view. Luther, Luther affirmed that among the articles of John Huss and the Hussites, which were condemned, are many which are truly Christian and evangelical, and which the church universal cannot condemn. This was sensational. There was a moment of shocked silence, and then an uproar above which could be heard Duke George's disgusted, God, sir, that's the plague. Eck pressed his advantage home, and Luther, trapped, admitted that since the, their decrees are also of human law, councils may err. This was the core of the doctrine. Man and church had the ability to err. God does not err. The scriptures are infallible. Man, however, is not. And so this is where the the doctrine of sola scriptura really takes shape. The scriptures are the final authority. It doesn't not the pope, not the councils, not your pastor, not the elders. What matters is what the Bible says. If the elders, if the pastors, if the popes, priests, whatever, go against the Bible, then we have a problem because it's not them who have final authority. It's the Bible that has final authority. And this is the doctrine of sola scriptura. Luther and the reformers were not making new doctrine, even though it might sound like they were, but confirming what had been taught from the scriptures themselves. And taught from Acts 5, 27 through 29. When they had brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, that is the name of Jesus. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. 
But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. And this is important because the, the, the council that they're brought before is the ruling council of Judaism of the time. They ruled the temple. They ruled the, the worship of the Almighty God in the temple complex. And so this, this uh, council had extreme power, and they ruled the religious class of, of Judaism of that time. And so to, to go against this council was something really very astonishing, just as Luther saying that the, that the Catholic councils didn't, they could err. Some have asserted that the, doctrines, the doctrine of sola scriptura suggests we are not to use any external literature or authority besides the scriptures themselves, as I stated before. This, however, is not the doctrine of sola scriptura and negates the very authoritative structures the Bible puts, for, puts forward. Sola scriptura claims scripture as final authority. What I mean by that is this. We see within the Bible itself that there are authority structures. In other words, God gives us authority structures. So the Bible can't be the only authority. No, there are other authorities that even the Bible itself sets up. We have deacons, we have elders, we have husband and wives and children, all these different things, elders. So these all these are all authority structures, but the final authority is the Bible. And that's what Sola Scriptura teaches. In 1521 at the Diet of Worms, Luther stated, and I quote, Your Imperial Majesty and your Lordship demand a simple answer. Here it is, plain and unvarnished. Unless I am convicted of error by the testimony of Scripture, or since I put no trust in the unsupported authority of Pope and councils, since it is plain that they have often erred and often contradicted themselves, by manifest reasoning, I stand convicted by the scriptures to which I have appealed, and my conscience is taken captive by God's word. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to act against our conscience is neither safe for us nor open to us. Sola Scriptura also does not suggest that the Bible touches on everything a person may need to know in life, or every aspect of life. John MacArthur said, Sola Scriptura simply means that all truth necessary for our salvation and spiritual life is taught either explicitly or implicitly in the scriptures. It is not a claim that all truth of every kind is found in scripture. The most ardent defender of Sola Scriptura will concede, for example, that scripture has little or nothing to say about DNA structures, microbiology, the rules of Chinese grammar, or rocket science. This or that scientific truth, for example, may or may not be actually true whether or not it can be supported by scripture. But scripture is a more sure word, standing above all other truth, its authority and in its authority and certainty. End quote. The battle over this foundational doctrine was long and bloody. Many people died, died fighting against the governmental and religious powers that held believers captive, all to assert the power and authority of the inspired books of Scripture. Surprisingly, we are still having to fight this battle today. And we see this within various offshoots of Christianity. I've, I've brought up the Mormons before, but, the, but they're a good example. Mormonism brings forth extra books that are added to Scripture, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrines and Covenant, and so on and so forth. We see the same thing in Islam. Islam uh, said that the Bible was not enough, that there was a better, uh, a better word to, to uh, ascribe to. And so they, they bring the Quran into to things. Even Judaism will bring in things like the, the Kabbalah and the writings of the rabbis, like the Talmud and the Mishnah. No, we stand on scripture only. Sola Scriptura is what the foundation of our faith is. And so this is what this doctrine teaches. All scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, 
fulfill your ministry. I hope that this journey through the formation of the Bible has helped you. I hope that it has strengthened your faith to understand that the Bible is trustworthy, that it is uh, the inspired Word of God, that it it was inspired through the Holy Spirit, through men and women that uh, were uh, charged to write these things down, and then were confirmed by Christians and the Christian Church to be the Word of God. Once again, we know that uh, that the Torah was given to Moses and that this uh, was was accepted as scripture because of the, the events that happened around it. From there, we have prophecy of the coming Messiah that came true. The coming Messiah then affirms what we already knew, that the Old Testament is the word of God and that the prophecies about Jesus Christ were in fact true. His followers, the followers of our Messiah, of the Christ, they wrote down different events and different uh, doctrine. And they were willing to die for it. And we know that since the, the, the Jesus Christ was the one that was prophesied, we know that his followers were speaking the truth as well. And from there, we can tell that the books that they wrote, the, the books that are in the Bible, are inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it is through the church that has established what books were, in fact, God-breathed, And the closing of that canon that shows us that the 66 books that we have in our Bibles today are the true word of God and that we can stand on that foundation. I hope that this course has benefited you. I hope that you can now take this information, stand firm on it, read your Bible, study your Bible, and then teach the Bible to those around you. Be willing and ready to have a defense, but also be excited about what's in the word of God Go out and tell other people about the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope that you've enjoyed this, and I hope to see you in another course here on Growing in Messiah.